So today has been a cuckoo bananas wild day for me because, you know, I was out here in the soap shop working and doing my thing thing, right? And I got a text from one of my girlfriends on the PTA and she said, guess what? We can volunteer at the school again. All you need to do is, you know, show up and fill out the background check thing again because like we have to do the background check every year and one would think that I probably have not done anything in the last year so it was going to go through really quickly and you know send your or give your COVID vaccination card to the school so they can show that you're capable of you know being here and following the rules in Washington State and you can volunteer and so I'm out here and my hair is pulled back weird I just like washed it and then just pulled it back and so that's why I got the cool curl going on that's fun because it was wet when I did that thing and um, ran to the school and did all those things so I could hang out and actually help out with the PTA and the book drive and, you know, the fundraisers that they're doing this week for Teacher Appreciation Week. So I've been doing that all day. I've had a mask on my face. My face looks probably very, very strange as a result. It is what it is. But after that really awesome, cool day, I realized, shit, today is a deep dive. And so I had no time to get prepared for any of this today, guys. I got to go do something that I love more than anything, which is, you know, being active and present in uh, my children's life and in their uh, school life, and that was cool. So I'm going to be here just with you doing this deep dive literally the same day that it goes out. So it's basically alive, and that's crazy. Um, so that's it. That's my day, and we are doing a deep dive. I will tell you all about the deep dive in just a minute, but before I do, hello. I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things, and you are here for day 148 of 365 days of soap. And as I said, today's a deep dive, and we are doing all about olive oil today. We are talking about olive oil, where it comes from, how old it is, what it's used for, the production rate, how we use it in soap, and the controversy surrounding it. You know, like we've been doing. Now, with coconut oil and palm oil, the controversy is a little bit bigger than olive, and by a little bit, I mean a lot of it, but there is still some controversy with olive oil, so we definitely will touch on that, you know, later on in the video. But for right now, we're going to start this the way we start all of these things at the beginning. So, why is olive oil, and how old is it? How old is olive oil? Well... Like I said with coconuts, it's old, but olive oil is real old. Like some places date it back to like the Upper Paleolithic era, like 12,000 BC, which is a long time ago. And they trace that back through different documents and writings and things on walls and all the things that have been found and dated and all that jazz, right? But as far as cultivation and actually creating olive oil and a proper pressing system and all of that, we basically trace it back to like the 12th century BC. So that's still a really long time ago. All of, all of trees have been around and have been used culturally in all manner of cultures and places and things throughout the world. I mean, it's in the Bible, right? I'm pretty sure. Olive branch, that's a thing in the Bible, right? I don't Bible. But yeah, it's been around forever. In ancient Egypt, they found like olive branch crowns and olive branches and like olives in like Tutankhamun's tomb. 
which is wild. And in Athens, statesmen used it for all. It's always, it's been on sigils. It's been, olives in some form have been around forever. And olives as a fruit were, you know, given to the gods and given to important people and pharaohs and all of those things and seen as like a really awesome, cool thing to eat. And then because when something is cool, we like to see what else it can do outside of just being edible. And so we figured that out, right? And so they started pressing it and found that the juice that came from the olive, because that's technically what olive oil is. Olive is a fruit. Therefore, this is a fruit juice. Crazy. But they found that the olive oil, the, the fruit juice that comes from olives, essentially, was good for all manner of things. It was so they would use it in ceremonial stuff and sacramental stuff and skin loving stuff, just stuff, stuff, just across the board. And yeah, been around for a very long time. Interestingly, we will talk more about production and yield and all of that stuff later. But I did want to talk about this during the how old is olive oil. There is a tree in Greece, an olive tree, that is over 3,000 years old, and it is still producing olives to this day, apparently. So saith the interwebs. I haven't personally seen it, nor have I experienced any olives or olive oil from said tree. But according to the interwebs, and I'll link some articles below, it's a 3,000 year old olive tree. And that's cuckoo bananas because remember we were talking about coconut oil and palm oil the trees themselves only produce fruits or seeds or you know whatever for like 60 70 years 3000 year old olive tree still producing olives wild wild that's crazy and cool and so therefore you know that's actually a pretty awesome like tree to have in the world because why would you ever need to cut it down right if it still continues to produce let it do so let it keep producing and being awesome, right? So yeah, olive oil has been around for a very, very long time. It's been used again for anointing. It's been used as a fuel so source in religious ceremonies, like the light things. It's been used obviously for food. In like ancient Roman times, there was this, this thing called vatica, like a cake that was made out of just flour, salt, and olive oil. So an olive oil cake, which, you know, sounds kind of interesting. And I don't know, if you're into the taste of olive oil, maybe you could try making one of those guys and see how you like it. Because for those of you that like the taste of olive oil, I imagine it'd be a very enjoyable experience. Now, so it's been around forever. It hasn't necessarily been used in soap for forever. And those reasons actually do go back to, probably, what we were talking about when we were talking about, you know, soap and the history of soap making. Olive oil had been around for thousands and thousands of years before they started making soap. So it only logically flowed that eventually they would start making soap out of olive oil. But before they did that, yeah, yeah, totally. It's edible. It's used on the skin, lots of skin loving benefits. It's used in ceremonious things. The olive branches are a symbol of like peace and all cool things. Point is olive oil, olives, olive trees. Are old and it wasn't just for like edible purposes that people would use it and find benefits right there was actually medicinal curative properties to olive oil that you know like Hippocrates would talk about and shit right and so it would treat sore throats and and use in ointments to heal wounds and it's all the things you know I talked about with coconut oil being like this very life-giving you know tree and coconuts and awesome and it is so too olive oil and olive trees and you know maybe arguably even more so okay so now olive trees where do they come from actually that's kind of fascinating and it sort of depends on what it is you're talking about like what type of trees right it's assumed that like wild olive trees originally came from the area that is now Turkey like 6,000 years ago and so there's that so it's like Asia Minor right but the modern olive tree as we know it today probably originated from Persia or Mesopotamia and then it moved into Syria and Israel although some scholars I mean there's a lot of debate with all of that as to where it actually came from who did it first who was cultivating it first some scholars argue that the ancient Egyptians were doing it long before anybody else and there are things to back that up so where does it come from basically this area of the world here 
Now, who produces the majority of olive oil today? Currently, as it stands, the biggest producer of olive oil worldwide is the European Union, is the EU, which is like a shit ton of countries. So specifically, let's talk about that. So the EU as a whole produces about 69% of the world's total olive oil annually. And of that, of the EU's contribution to the total world bucket, Spain produces about 63% of that. So that's not nothing. Well over half comes from Spain. It wasn't always the case. Italy was doing olive oil production and consumption and everything for a long time and in massive amounts. But there's actually records kind of early on in Italy's time period showing that they were importing olive oil, olives in general, from Spain. So Spain's been a big player in that game for a very long time as well. Now, the nine states, countries, things in the EU that are really big producers in the whole olive oil thing, we've got Spain doing the most, right? Then we have Italy, Greece, Portugal, France, Slovenia, Croatia, Malta, and Cyprus? Cyprus makes sense. That makes all the sense in the world, actually. And so of those nine countries, they again produce about 69% of the world's total olive oil needs. And so that's a lot. California produces some, Mexico produces some. There are a smattering of other countries the world over that do make up the rest of that you know, bulk, so the rest of the remaining 31%. But for the most part, if you are getting olive oil from anywhere, it's likely coming from the EU, more than likely coming from Spain. My lights just changed colors. Hey Alexa, turn off the galleon. Okay. Thanks. Okay, now that we know from whence olive oil came, let's talk about how it's produced. Well, it's while the mechanics and the science behind, you know, actually extracting olive oil has, you know, advanced, you know, over the centuries, the still basic method is essentially collecting the olives and then pressing them, right? And rinsing them and doing all the things. Now, I don't know where you're from and if you're at all familiar with this, but we used to, when I was a child, would, we used to go out to the prairie and we would collect pinion pine nuts. And there were these little itty, teeny tiny bitty little black, you know, nuts that looked a lot like, like poop, like deer poop or some sort of poop, poop. And we would go out with my uh, grandparents and we would collect them from the ground, right? And then take them home and make sure that there wasn't any poop in it and wash them and cook them and all the things. And so with olives, a lot of that actually does still happen depending on the production level of the actual like olive plantations and farms and things. It essentially involves like beating the trees until the olives fall off and now they have like netting systems underneath to catch or different like sort of like scrapers to collect and again it all depends on how well really how much money the actual olive orchard thing has, but still kind of that basic premise. And they take all these olives and they wash them and then crush them to remove the pits, which is weird. So the olives that like come in the can that we put into like, uh, um, you know, veggie trays for like Thanksgiving and stuff. And I swear to God, that's the only time I ever actually just have olives in front of me. They don't have pits in them but they do have a hole in them. So you can like put one on each of your fingers and it's a good time. That must mean that they de-pitted them and that's where that hole comes from, right? I don't eat olives. But anyway, so there's crushing and rinsing and pressing and everything to get the olive juice, the olive oil, the fruit juice out. And then the remaining pulp is then put into like another bag and it's gone through like a second press. And then that second press is then mixed with another grade of olive oil and that's essentially what becomes pomace. To that, you basically have three different types of olive oil. You have the EVOO, the extra virgin olive oil. You have the regular virgin olive oil, and then you have the pomace. And really all of that means, just like kind of with coconut and the different types, is just how much it was manipulated and or chemically cleaned to ensure purity. 
there were a lot of interesting articles going to straight like all of like orchards, vineyard sites, reading about their methods. And it seems like there are a lot of countries out there that require some pretty extra stringent things in the production of olive oil that does require some sort of chemical adulteration to ensure that the olive oil itself is very pure. Also, EVOO apparently is one of the biggest uh, leaders of labeling fraud, which we will talk about later when we talk, touch on a couple of the different controversies with olive oil. But, you know, just keep that in mind for now. That was interesting in and of itself, so put a pin in that one. But with the final byproduct, after you've, you know, crushed and rinsed and extracted the olive in the first press for EVOO, and then basically done it again and filtered it for the regular virgin olive oil and then taken all that was left, all the pulp or whatever, and pressed it again for the pomace that's then mixed with the regular virgin olive oil for consistency and fluidity and all of the things, you have a byproduct. And just like with coconut oil and palm oil, the olive oil's byproduct is also usable, but it's also kind of bad for the environment. It's called something like Amurka, I think. Yeah, Amurka. And that in and of itself, I guess, is a pretty big pollutant because it's very high in salt, has a very low pH, lots of phenols and stuff in it. But the Romans used to use it for all manner of things. Apparently, the Amurka, the, the dregs of the olive, when you're done with getting the olive oil out of it, it can be used for livestock feed. They would use it to, like, tan leather. Used as a fertilizer, which I don't super understand because if it's... A low salt, high salt, low pH. I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about planting things either. Guys, I, you guys can help me in the comments as to why that would be a good fertilizer. Anyway, anyway, point is, even the dregs of olives are used, you know, somewhat, or can be used, rather, somewhat responsibly. Although this one does sort of confuse me a little bit. So if you guys know more about that, I would love to talk to you below because that one just made my brain hurt. Okay, so EVOO is obtained through like the pressing, right? And the and EVOO, from what I can tell, the big differences between EVOO and regular virgin olive oil has a lot to do with the acidity and how much they have to adjust it. So it's EVOO if it's cold pressed for a cycle and the acidity is 1% or less. If the acidity is between 1 and 3%, it's now already classified as like regular virgin olive oil or pure olive oil, uh, but it does have to go through a chemical process to drop that acidity down. And then the olive pomace, as I said before, that's the one that's going to be the most messed with, right? And so just like with coconut oil, it's kind of your different grades are based on how much the oil was messed with before getting it to the shelf. For the most part, unless you are specifically buying EVOO off of the shelves, you are going to be messing with pure olive oil, virgin olive oil. Kind of an interchangeable thing there. And that's true within your cooking, again, unless you are specifically buying EVOO, as well as the majority of your soap making. We will talk more about whether or not there is a benefit to use EVOO versus anything else, you know, when we start talking about how we use it in soap. But that's basically how it's all produced and what the different classifications mean. And let's go on to uh, how much oil comes from, you know, an olive. Okay, as far as yield goes, olive oil is a bit hard to pin down, kind of like palm, but really for different reasons. Palm, one of the reasons you can't fully pin it down is because we have very pro-palm sites, we have very anti-palm sites, and so you kind of have to look at them both and make your own reasonable determination in the middle. Olive oil, the real reason why it's hard to like super pin down is just because, well, olive production in and of itself, the tree itself, it, it can be a bit finicky. It's basically every other year, usually, an olive tree actually produces olives. And the variety of olive, the type of olive, the conditions around it, the amount of water it got that year, how it was fertilized, all of those things will also impact how much production is for any given year. For like an acre of olive trees, right, it can be anywhere between one 
to nine tons of olives. So the easy estimation for all of that is four tons, right? So let's just say across the board, one acre of olive trees produces four tons of olives. Now, how much olive oil do you get from said four tons of olives? Now that too varies uh, based on a lot of things, mostly the maturity of the olive and when you are pressing, because you really do want the olive to be in that peak state of maturity to get the biggest yield out of the olive itself, the most oil. If you press it too soon or too late, you are going to get less. And so there is a range there too, but kind of like the baseline estimate is 40 gallons of olive oil per ton, right? And so if you can get four tons of olives from an acre and it's 40 gallons per ton, it's 160 gallons of olive oil. Hey Siri, what's 160 times seven? So that means what? It's around 1,100 pounds of olive oil per acre. Now, again, putting this in a perspective that, you know, makes sense to me when I'm looking at my eco footprint and, you know, what that all means for me personally, I use about 5,000 pounds of olive oil a year, basically the same as coconut oil. Yeah. And so I would need about five acres, just like with coconut oil for my needs for olive. Now, the secondary problem with all of that is just like, unlike the, the coconut, this is all that can really come from this, right? And so it's that five acres that's kind of almost fully on me. I mean, not entirely, but also yes. And so that's kind of an interesting thing to keep in mind that yield is nowhere near the yield of, you know, palm and We'll go ahead and throw the same infograph up again and you can look at its similarities to you know coconut oil and the other vegetable oils you know out there now i will double check this before i post and if what i'm saying right now is wrong i will make sure to adjust and pin the comment below but from what i can tell it's there's about 2.5 million acres of olive trees in the world in modern production now again that is modern like actual commercialized production and this is where i need to double check to see if we have better numbers for like farms like family farms that have been passed down because that's one of the cool things about olives in and of themselves and olive trees they do get passed down as you know property and land and whatever because you know, going back to that three thousand year old tree it's actually a cool thing to be left, you know, the olive grove of your grandparents. That's awesome. I mean, we're all familiar with that, right? Like there's something that gets passed down and whatever, like my grandparents, for example, grew and maintained and took care of a thriving cattle ranch with lots and lots of land and lots and lots of cows. And, you know, that all got broken down and given to all of the children when they passed before they passed, but that's none of your business. So, but with something like, you know, just some land that grandma and grandpa grazed some cows on, well, I mean, that's one thing and land is obviously valuable, but olive groves in and of themselves, they already come with a good value proposition just because of their sort of innate ability to continue being a hardy plant and growing and producing and being awesome. So it's kind of a built-in business at whatever scale you really wanna take it if you are, you know, interested in the actual production and development of, you know, this sort of agriculture. So that's cool. But as far as I can tell, as far as commercial, actual olive acreage, right? This is so hard for me. It's an orchard, right? If it's a fruit, it's an orchard. I'm calling it orchard for the rest of the time. As far as I can tell for actual olive orchards worldwide, it's about two and a half million acres worldwide that makes up all of our total consumption. Now let's talk about consumption. How much olive oil do we as humans use in a year? Now this is another place where I really have to go back and double check these stats based on olive oil because two and a half million acres and one acre gets us 1,100-ish pounds, which is less than a ton. It's half a ton if we're weighing like that, right? but the overall consumption of the world annually is three million tons done on two and a half million acres 
I mean, I guess it makes sense going back to what I was saying before with the yield and how it varies based on a number of factors. And also it would make sense with if we're only talking about commercial olive orchards and not the smaller ones. So I guess that all still tracks ish, but these numbers are very interesting. And for something as commonplace as olive oil, I don't understand why, but that's the whole thing. That's, that's the statistic that we are being given 3 million tons a year consumed worldwide. And the EU consumes over half of that 1.6 million metric tons consumed just within the EU. So that is interesting considering the big boom that we have experienced in the United States with olive oil in the past, you know, 20, 30 years. I, find this interesting just like I found the palm oil consumption of the United States interesting. I always assumed that we were some sort of player in the global sphere as far as consumption of, you know, anything goes, but I guess you really do have to keep in mind that although the United States is a very, very large land mass, we only have like 330 million people and out of like 7 billion people on the planet, we're kind of a drop in the bucket. So, I guess it makes sense and all of that tracks that we are not even close to any sort of big consumption of olive oil annually. But if you're in the EU, you produce most of it and you consume most of it. So, you know, well done you keeping things in house. Actually, interestingly, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily keeping it in house. And I know why this makes sense because I grew up in an area that produced a lot of potatoes, right? And it was actually more expensive to buy potatoes that were actually grown and raised right on that road and that farm right there than coming from Idaho, which was wild. So in actuality, Spain, biggest producer of olive oil, they export the majority of their olive oil. So it's all wild. Commerce is a crazy thing. Next up we're talking about controversies, environmental impact, and all of the things. I don't know why I'm leaning like this. Okay, so let's talk about controversy and things you should look out for when buying olive oil. And I guess we should pick off the low hanging fruit <laughs> and also probably the most known controversy and that is fake olive oil. Now, this is actually an interesting thing that has really had a lot more attention in recent years than it has in years past, but it's argued that fake olive oil has been around since forever. Now, what the hell is fake olive oil? Well, as we talked about before with, you know, extra virgin olive oil being thus and pure olive oil being thus, basically in order to be classified as like extra virgin olive oil, it means essentially one press, cold press, no adulteration, right? No chemicals were used, no whatever. And the purity standards exist. And there are a number of different councils, just literally the world over, that ensure this purity standard. And one of them is the International Olive Council, right? The IOC. And they do have standards for adulteration and what makes extra virgin olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. So one would assume that if you are getting olive oil that's uh, labeled, especially in the United States, because like over 90% of our olive oil is imported, one would assume that if your label says, you know, made in Spain or made in Italy, right, that it is extra virgin olive oil and it has not been adulterated. That's actually not true. And the reason for that is the importing and exporting that occurs between countries. Italy is like the world's biggest importer and exporter of olive oil. And it's again, in the last like five, six years or so, they, there was this big like sting operation essentially. And they took like thousands of tons or something from Italy of like fake olive oil. Going back to what makes olive oil fake. Well, the biggest way that it makes that it becomes fake is if it gets cut with something else with like a soybean or a rice bran or any other kind of oil. And once it crosses from one country to another and that country has less stringent, you know, 
standards for its exporting, or if Italy is exporting into the United States, which up until a few years ago had no governmental standards, no requirements on the importing of olive oil, then that's the time when a shady company is going to do shady things. Because as we talked about in multiple, you know, videos before, when something can be exploited, someone is going to exploit it. And so to cut their prices, to reduce their bottom line, to get more money, they were cutting olive oil, EVOO, with a cheaper oil, with a lesser oil. And so again, up until a couple of years ago in the States, we actually had no regulations surrounding that. The government did put in, Congress did actually put into effect a few years ago, a new standard of measurement under the guise of there may be a nut oil, you know, potential allergen pollutant in this. And so they're now more strict, but it's still kind of a crapshoot either way. And so interestingly, I learned with this whole EVOO thing, if you want to, if the, the easiest way to insure as a consumer, like, and I'm talking about consumer, you are buying this off the grocery store shelves, to eat, right? Because extra virgin olive oil comes at a bit of a price tag. And so you want to make sure that you're actually getting what you're paying for. If you see olive oil from Australia or from Chile, that's the real deal because their standards are so strict. They implement it so well. And they are the few factories out there that do not mix like last batch with new batch and continue on their production. So those are the two best countries to buy your EVOO from if you are looking at, you know, consumption. As far as what that does in soap, I mean, we will get to that when we're talking about what it actually, what olive oil in general does in soap. But for right now, I'm just talking about the controversy of fake EVOO as a we're going to consume it type perspective, because again, that shit's expensive. And so you don't want to buy the fake kind. Now, another less known controversy, but still a big ass problem involves the night harvesting of olives. Now, night harvesting is done really because the cooler temperatures allow the olive to sort of maintain all of its awesome flavonoids. I don't really think they're flavonoids, but the things that make it taste the best in the olive. So at night in the countries that are like in the Mediterranean basin, you know, Spain is the one that's really calling on this in big freaking ways. They will take the like the vacuum things out that suck up all of the olives that have fallen on the ground to do the thing, right? And as a result, it's also sucking up a whole lot of songbirds, which are like legally protected birds. And so it's killing a shit ton of birds by this practice. And, you know, that sucks. It's just like, you know, when we're talking about palm and the orangutans and the elephants and all of the things and, you know, coconut oil and what I was telling you about coconut oil is hurting species and the, you get it, go back and watch. It's a problem. We obviously don't want any of our harvesting or anything that we're doing here to hurt something else here. And so when we can avoid it, we should. But you know, it's estimated that in Andalusia that uh, like two and a half million songbirds are killed every year through this night harvesting because they like rest in the trees and the bushes and then they get sucked up through this vacuum thing and then they're dead. Two and a half million birds in one area of the world every year. Well, that's shitty. So, you know, let's not do that. Now, a couple of countries are looking into this right now, notably Spain and Portugal, trying to see what they can do to allow, you know, olive farmers to continue, you know, doing their thing and keeping their business afloat while keeping these birds, which are legally protected birds, alive. And so they're looking into it. As far as I know, no real steps have been taken and... So what we do as consumers, I don't know. I don't actually know the answer to that. I had some sort of answer for Palm, but don't buy olive oil that comes from Spain, but that's almost impossible to tell, especially in the quantities and the way that we buy our olive oil to make soap. So I don't know. Um... As I said in the palm oil video, boycotting isn't the best solution because they're never effective. 
buy all of your olive oil from Australia, California, and Chile? I guess the first step is to have an awareness and you know for those of you that live in Spain or Portugal or any I think France also has a pay attention vote do the things and for us like in America or any other place that olive oil is imported to in bulk go to our congressional representatives and hope that they care about olive oil I don't know that's a really hard one for sure but it is a controversy and you should be made aware of it and I am just reporting the news at this point because I don't have any good brilliant awesome idea on how to fix any of it but know that this is a problem and it does impact you know the world Okay, now for environmental impact, and actually before I get too far into that, I want to correct something I said earlier about the amount of uh, acreage worldwide for olive. Again, it was on that. But two, I was refreshing uh, from my notes and everything and just saw in one of these journals that I read a very interesting paper about you know the environmental impact of olive oil just across the board and already they're listing in this synopsis six million hectares so I was wrong before sorry anyway speaking of this paper I will link it below it's about 74 pages long you're welcome to read it it's a very fascinating overall look at olive oil production and what it does for the environment and the environment means a number of things right we're not just talking about the literal environment and the ozone and the breathing in and out and the soil and all the jazz although of course that is addressed we're also talking about the economic impact of the environment too, the environmental you know because that's all part of the environment in which you live in regards to all of these countries that are producing the bulk of the world's olive oil now in general, obviously the environmental impact is going to be problems with fertilization, soil erosion, just the typical things that you run into with all agriculture, for sure. Not a lot of deforestation going on for olive oil, and that makes sense because, again, ancient trees continue to produce, etc., 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 so that isn't a huge problem. It has happened a little bit, but not a ton. The economic impact of olive is overall positive for all of the countries in which olive oil is uh, made. I mean, think about it when I was saying earlier how some of these olive groves, orchards, things are passed on from generation to generation to generation. This is a sustainable crop that continues to yield, that continues to have a yield. And so it therefore impacts the economy and continues to be a positive overall. So overall at the end of this paper, which again, I'll link below, go read it. It's fun. It's mostly good. Um, you're again, running into the same run of the mill, but you don't have anything nearly as devastating as palm or arguably coconut oil when it comes to olives, with the exception of course of the songbirds. And that is problematic in and of itself, but it's on the grand scale, it's a general positive for olive oil production to continue. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, had to go let the dogs in. It is pouring rain. I really hope I'm going to be able to get the sound of the rain falling on the roof out of the audio, but I might not. So, you know, I'm just going to roll with me. It's going to be awesome. Let's talk about olive oil and soap. And this is where everything gets confusing, right? Because I've told you three basic types. You got EBOO, you got virgin slash pure, and you have olive pomace. Well, when you start messing with it when in soap, it gets different. It gets different. We've got so many other types. Like just on Soper's Choice alone, we have olive pomace with 50% rice bran. So you obviously know what that means. It's been cut with rice bran, the pomace, the final extraction. Um, olive refined A, olive pomace, olive, olive extra virgin, olive extra virgin organic. So what the hell does this all mean? That's a lot of different types. Okay, so let's start off with the olive extra virgin organic. Organic means, just like with coconut oil and everything else, that it was made, it was made, not made. 
it was grown without the use of fertilizers or pesticides. That's basically what we can assume organic to mean in most cases. So that's what you got for the organic extra virgin. Because remember, extra virgin always, always has to be the cold press, the first press, and it has to have an acidity level of less than 1%, right? And then you have the virgin olive oil and the pure olive oil, which kind of exist in the same category, and that acidity, it can come from the first press for the virgin olive oil, can still come from the first press, so that acidity level is between 1% and 3%, okay? Now, the pure mostly is a blend of virgin or extra virgin, usually a second press, but because they're so similar and the acidity level is the same, it realistically is always lumped in with, you know, virgin. Virgin and pure, kind of interchangeable. So what the hell is grade A? I don't really know. I mean, every website that I looked on, every .gov page, every .gov page, every governmental page from any other country, if it said anything about grade A at all, it conflicted with what another governmental agency or olive orchard thing website said. Most of them had nothing to say about grade A. So let's just go straight to Soper's Choice and see what they have to say about it. It says olive oil refined A is the third cold pressing from the fruit of the olive, not the kernel or pit. It is then refined. No solvents are used in this process. It is considered vegan, lactose-free, gluten-free, glutamate-free, BSE-free, no hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils, no preservatives. So it's from the third press. Okay, so there's another one. And as for the last olive pomace, we know that to be the final expelling of just getting everything out of everything that's left in the olive pits and skins and everything and then you know cleaned and sometimes blended with probably a pure or a grade A to ensure consistency across the board. Now what does this mean in soap? Logically nothing and the reason for that is the fatty acid profile for all of these different types basically the same and that's also including the pomace mixed with the rice bran. So the fatty acid profile, which we'll talk about in a bit, is virtually the same with all of these different types. And so really what you're looking at, again, with, as with so many things, is price point and really what you want it to do in soap. So the darker the, the oil, the more potential you have for that green tinge to show up in your soaps. An example of that would be the olive pomace right? And so if you don't want the green to show up or you don't want to be messing with the potential of, you know, something strange happening in your batch because you're using a darker olive oil, then you would go for the lighter versions. You'd go for the EVOO or the grade A or, you know, whatever, and maybe avoid the pomace. Also, side note to that, soap makers do claim that pomace oil uh, accelerates trace. That personally has never been my experience with uh, pomace. But I can see why maybe that would happen. And it wouldn't be because of the differences in like a fatty acid profile, because they're very, very similar. It would have, I'm thinking, more to do likely with the chemicals and solvents that are used to clean and make sure we don't have any pits or shells or anything in the actual pomace itself that may be doing weird things in the olive pomace. To that, the olive pomace is tested. It has to be tested to even determine the fatty acid profile to even be marketed. And so as far as unsaponifiables go, they don't exist in a high enough uh, ratio to change the actual fatty acid composition by much of anything. But arguably an unsaponifiable and all that would be again, the aforementioned chemicals and solvents that could have been left behind during the final extraction process. So there's that to consider. Now let's talk about those fatty acid profiles, what they do in soap, what the point of all of it is, and you know, all of the things. Okay, so the fatty acid composition of olive oil, and this is basically the same for all of them. Again, all different types have the same saponification value. So like 
0.19 for sodium hydroxide and like 0.135 for potassium hydroxide. Pretty sure that's right. Yeah, and they all have the same fatty acid composition. So oleic, linoleic, palmitic, and a little bit of stearic is basically what we're looking at. And there's big ranges in all of these. And so one of the questions that we often get as, you know, professional soap makers or, you know, master soap makers or whatever from the noobs that are coming on the scene is, well, I just did this batch and then I did this batch and the same, used olive oil both times, but things feel different. It's different. Why is it different? Well, the ranges in olive oil, they're pretty big. It's like between 55 and 85-ish percent oleic acid, kind of a big range. Between like 3 and 21 percent linoleic acid, it's kind of a big range. And between like 70 to 20 percent palmitic acid, it's kind of a big range. And it varies. The range is that wide just because of the different types of olives that are used or the when it was pressed or how it was cultivated. There's a lot of things that go into, you know, an olive oil. And so that range is what you're looking at. And the ranges are different because, and can change your soaping, because if you're getting an olive oil in one batch that has, you know, 55% oleic and 20% palmitic, well, I mean, that's going to make your bar harder and have a cooler lather than a, an olive oil that has like 83% oleic and only like 7% palmitic. Make sense? So what do the acids actually do? What do they, what does it all mean? Well, oleic acid, as we know, that leads to your nice, moisturizing, gentle cleanse. But it also leads to that slippery, slimy feel. And so this is one reason why, just for me personally, I don't really like, you know, olive oil soaps because I don't like the sliminess that comes from it and I feel like it's hard to wash off my hands. Now, what does the linoleic acid do? The linoleic in soap making, the linoleic acid basically does the same thing as the oleic, except less of a greasy feel and more of the potential for rancidity. So oils that are high in linoleic acid have the potential to get, you know, dreaded orange spots or whatever more than oils that are lower in linoleic acid. And so that's, I think, one reason why people are like, oh no, canola's bad, only go high oleic canola or something. Personally, I've never had dreaded orange spots in my life and I have made a lot of soap, so I don't know. But linoleic acid, it is legit that it can go rancid more quickly. So keep that in mind. And then what does palmitic do? Well, palmitic creates a nice hard bar. It stabilizes the lather. It's awesome. It's been said that oils high in palmitic acid can be drying. I haven't noticed that. I've made the palm oil soap last week, right? And that thing was awesome. I'm loving that. I think it's a great, it's a great idea for like an actual face cleanser bar. And then you have the steric, which also leads to further bar hardening. So the steric and the, uh, and the palmitic at most is going to comprise maybe 25% of the total fatty acid composition of an olive oil, right? So the remaining 75% at least is going to be oleic and linoleic. So really moisturizing, gentle cleanse, but not a good return on a bubble. And so I've talked about it before. I don't think you should really ever do 100% oil soaps. I think the recipe should be balanced just to ensure that, yeah, you're going to get that good gentle moisture from the oleic and the linoleic, but you also want the big bubble that's going to come from a palm or a coconut oil, something that has higher amounts of palmitic or lauric acid because that's what creates the big bubble. That said, Castile soaps are a whole ass thing and people love the shit out of them. So that's great. If you are in love with your olive oil soaps, yeah, do the olive oil soaps. They're a good time for sure. For me, I prefer to balance the batch. But the reason why you would get sliminess with an olive oil soap is going to be because of the high amounts of oleic and linoleic acid. Another reason why you're going to get a change from one olive oil soap to the next is because that range is so wide and not every single batch of oil that comes from every single factory is going to be tested to really dial that into this is the fatty acid profile for this particular pressed on date. It's just not going to happen. So if you ever have gremlins in the soap shop from one batch of olive oil to the next, it's probably because you opened up a new container of olive oil for your next batch of soap. 
again, going back to the pomace thing, performance wise or fatty acid profile wise, it's the same. Um, saponification wise, it's the same. Performance wise, I can see the logic behind the chemical extraction, leaving some residue in the oil. Not enough that it wouldn't pass testing, but enough that it might do weird things in soap. And so if we are talking about that as an unsaponifiable, you might want to take that into consideration when making your olive soaps with olive pomace because, well, what exactly were the chemicals used to do the final extraction of the olive oil from the seeds? And if it's unsaponifiable, does that mean that you are passing that on to your end user? This is a consideration. For my part, I use olive oil pomace. I don't find any problem with it, for sure. Um, we're dealing with rinse off products here. Obviously, if I were making a leave on product, I would never in a million years, well, A, I usually don't use olive oil at all, but two, I would use, you know, an EVOO or your grade A or your pure or you know, whatever and steer away from the pomace. But because it's a rinse off product and the whole process of it hitting water, bubbles, rinsing away. I don't think that any chemicals that remain that could potentially cause an acceleration of trace, but they're still not enough that it actually got caught in testing for purity is actually going to impact anything on the end user. But this is just my reasoning. We all have to make our own decisions as soap makers, so you make yours too. Okay, so wrapping this all up, what does it all mean? Well, olive oil is cool. Olive oil has been around for a really, really long time and its usage in the world uh, are everywhere. We eat it. We make salads out of it, which is also eating it. We use it topically. It's been used to treat wounds. It's been used to treat upset stomachs. Apparently a spoonful of olive oil a day helps with like hearts or something. Like it's all a thing. I don't understand what any of those things really ever are because, you know, there'll be all kinds of people out there just randomly putting oils in their mouth. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that. But apparently it's good for you there. And it's also beneficial in soap. Because of the oleic and the linoleic acids that exist within olive oil, I do recommend having something like that in your soap just for the conditioning properties because we want to obviously make sure that we're not drying out anybody's skin with our soap products because that shit sucks. We all remember detergent bars and that was never any fun. So we want our skin to be nice and supple and awesome all of the time. So I think that you should have a version of that, you know, 40%, 50%, whatever of your oleic and your linoleic making up your total recipe and your fatty acid profiles for any given soap recipe. That said, it doesn't necessarily have to be olive oil. So if you don't have olive oil, the substitutions out there, you'd be looking for things that are high in oleic and linoleic acid. So you'd be looking at like an avocado oil or a shea butter. The more expensive would be like an apricot oil. Um, the cheaper would be like a rice bran. So all of those would be acceptable substitutions for an olive oil, still getting you the nice oleic acid that you need. So there's that. Olive oil is cool. Olive oil soaps are cool. I highly recommend putting them into your soaps. The environmental impact on olive, it's from olive. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. Let's be aware that we're killing the songbirds because that is terrible. But the overall huge impact, these are trees that are still, you know, providing oxygen and doing the things and photosynthesis and plants are going to plant. And so that's good. And yeah, no, it's a, it's a self-sustainable crop. It kind of does its thing. It's very hardy. They last a long time, these trees, and they keep producing. It's very cool. And yeah, they help the economy around them and, you know, families and cultures and people and civilizations get to continue existing and buying food. So that's excellent. So there it is. All things olive oil. And I am so glad that you guys joined me for another deep dive on oils and stuff and things. And let me know in the comments below what you would like me to tackle next as far as the deep dive goes. I have an idea. I don't know if I want to do it. And I don't know if you're going to like glaze over because it's very sciencey. 
And so, I don't know. So you guys let me know below what you would like me to tackle on a deep dive next, and I will take that into consideration. If you want to see what I end up doing for the next deep dive or any other time, hey, subscribe, do things. For those of you who have done those things, hey, Sudsers, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. At the end of today, which was wild and crazy and fun, I got to finish it with you. And I literally am going to finish it with you because I need to go, you know, get this done and get it up on the YouTube thing so we can all hang out in the premiere together and, you know, chat live. So I appreciate that you joined me for another round of 365 days of soap. I will see you guys all again tomorrow for another round of soapy fun. Bye.